Uh, so I'm Ebert Upton, uh, and I'm one of the founders of Raspberry Pi. Um, when did Raspberry Pi? Where did Raspberry Pi come from? Um, one of the nice things is that Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi was mostly discussed on email. So we actually, the the, the records exist. Um, so um, where does where does Raspberry Pi come from? Well, I'd been trying to build small computers from about that time, that six month period after the PhD, when I was getting interested in uh, um, in, in electronics. I'd started trying to build cheap computers because I had. These Atmel, I mean, those Atmel AVR chips are amazing, right? You know, they can do an enormous amount. They cost virtually nothing. Um, and it just looked a little bit like they could be, um, you could actually build a computing platform on them, uh, that they were powerful enough that you could get something that felt kind of a BBC micro level computing platform. And of course, subsequently, um, you know, Fignition, for example, is exactly that, right? It's, it's using microcontrollers to build a kind of 8-bit era um, a piece of hardware. Uh, and I sort of thought, well, this was sort of 2006, and I thought, kind of, can I, could I do that? And what I came up with, should I pick this up? What I ended up with was this. So this is a, uh, um, this is a computer um, built on an AVR. So that's, a, that's an Atmega 644. So it's got 64K of SRAM in it. It's got a 20 megahertz, 20-ish megahertz, 8-bit processor, um, 64K of, of RAM. Um, that's a 512K SRAM. So it's actually got a decent amount of memory on there. You've got a kind of a, a, a kind of an amigury, uh, amigury amount of memory on there. And effectively what you've got is you've got 32, um, 32 GPIO pins on here, uh, which are used to, 19 of which are used to drive the uh, address bus on here, eight of which are used to move the, uh, the data back from here to, the, uh, to, to this. And then hanging off the, uh, hanging off the side here, hanging off the right hand side, you've got a, uh, this is a uh, video output. Uh, this is video output circuitry. So effectively, your, this thing is either, it's a little bit like a ZX81, right? It's using the CPU, the CPU in the system to do the video address generation. Um, so uh, during horizontal blank and vertical blank, this is available to do other work. During the display period, what it's doing is just sitting there grinding addresses out onto the, um, uh, onto the address bus. Data's falling out of this. Uh, it falls into these two things here, which are 72 series um, buffers which give you a nice bit of kind of punchier HC MOS. They give you a nice bit of punchy drive, resistor ladder DAC here, uh, and then this thing here. I had a cable that plugs into a SCART. Um, this thing renders uh, sort of some 3D graphics. Um, and this, so this was my first idea for, and the nice thing about that, you can build that yourself. It's built using dip chips. You know, there's no, no surface mount magic here. It's all done by on variable with track cutting. Um, and so that was kind of, I went and showed this to a bunch of people. Um, I apparently, I subsequently found, uh, Peter told me that if I just brought this to my Broadcom interview, I could just have skipped the interview. <laughs> um, so, um, the, um, so I showed this to a bunch of people and then I went off to work for Broadcom. And, and the kind of the thing about working for Broadcom was really demoralizing because um, we had these chips at Broadcom, the video core chips, which were about the same price as the AML chips, but massively more powerful. And it kind of really brought it home to me that, that there's no real point in doing this. What you want to do is try and find, your, find a way to get your hands on real chips. You know, these, these chips that you only really sell to, to mobile phone companies. You know, if you could get your hands on those, you could build something which was like this, but, um, but real. Um, and so that kind of killed off this. So I had this kind of six months of learning about AVR and then went to Broadcom and killed it off. But I showed this to enough people um, that uh, when a couple of years later people started to talk, people at the lab were starting to talk about whether we could build something, um, uh, my name came up. So there'd been a, um, there'd been a suggestion that um, MIT were going to make a clone of the... You don't like it when I drop the historical artifacts on the floor, don't you? Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, um, I, I lend it to museums sometimes. Um, and um, I tend to just mail it to them in a jiffy bag, which absolutely horrifies them. Um, the, uh, I can just build another one of it if I break it, probably. Uh, I have enough high-res photos of it that I can probably recover how it works. I've got the schematic somewhere. Um, so, um, where was I? Yes, so um, MIT were going to make a clone of the Apple II, um, and... They'd been on Slashdot or something, and they were going to they were going to make a very cheap computer. and And some email traffic went around between a bunch of us uh, involved with the computer lab, including John Crowcroft, 
a lot of the early emails of, of Professor John Crowcroft, who's the Marconi, Marconi chair at the lab. Um, and um, it had the title Redo BBC Micro. And the, the, the theme was, uh, well, hang on a second, the MIT are doing this thing, and where, where computers come from. The computer lab is where computers come from. We should redo the BBC Micro. And there was some discussion as to whether it would be possible to build a, basically build a BBC Micro, you know, at a higher level of integration, you know, something which had backwards compatibility. Um, uh, and then sort of drifted on to people saying, hang on, you were demoing that thing a couple of years ago. Why is, it, is, is that the thing? Um, and I explained why it wasn't. Uh, and then there was a wonderful email from uh, John which, in this thread, which just has perhaps call it Raspberry written in it. And so, and this is this was the first time that someone had mentioned, you know, uh, this is this is what this is the first time someone had mentioned the name Raspberry in, in connection with machines like this. Um, and, and very rapidly, we sort of settled on trying. A group of us settled on trying to do something um, in this in this area. And I had, a, I had a demo based on a Broadcom dev kit, so I'd taken the next step. So I had a demo based on the 2707 DK. It doesn't have an arm in. Uh, and it had a port of Python that ran on the, uh, the, well, the VPU, which is the, the DSP that we have in, in all video call products. Um, and so I ported CPython to run on the DSP, and I had a PS2 kind of um, hacked up bit of Veriboard with a PS2 level shifters for a PS2 keyboard interface. Um, and uh, you could boot the thing up and boot it into Python. You could start typing Python. It had a little file system on SD card. Uh, and so you could, you could had a t little text editor. And it was just the first thing that felt like, you know, it had a video core in it. It was, you know, you could do good 3D graphics and video. It started to feel like a, like a Raspberry Pi. Right? It's a thing that inter it was almost exact interpolation between this thing with its very custom software world and not much performance, and the Raspberry Pi now with its very standards-based software world and high performance. This had still had the, the custom software feel of this thing, um, but the, uh, the more of the modern level of, of performance, which we very quickly realized was going to be important to getting kids excited about it. But the original version was not about getting kids excited. That was getting you excited. It was about getting me excited. It was about what can you build. You know, this stuff was all about what can you build. And so there was this kind of collision between um, the, uh, you know, building things with no real fixed idea of what we were, what we were trying to accomplish and this crisis at the same time we were perceiving this decline in the number of people applying to study computer science. And it was this kind of like several things coming together, you know, hardware that I'd built, this realisation we were all having that we were in trouble in terms of levels of interest in computing among kids. Uh, and then this kind of slightly competitive, this third thing with this kind of catalyst that came in this slightly competitive, hang on a second, MIT are building cheap hardware, we should do this. And of course, nothing ever came of that MIT thing, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so it was just kind of, it was fortunate, it was good luck. Um, so we, at the point where we had the kind of the, the, the Broadcom based thing, there was a, there was a, a feeling that, that, that those of us who were interested in this, um, there was a feeling that we that we had something that there was that it was worth making an organisation around this device, and it already had a name. It had the Raspberry from John's suggestion. It had the Pi from Python, because that was all the all the all that the prototype could run. Um, and so yeah, we got we got this organisation together in terms of the trustees. I mean, it's four of us from the four of us from the computer lab. So Rob, who was my successor as uh, director of Studies at St. John's, so I was experiencing all the same problems I'd experienced as Director of Studies in terms of finding um, new, new undergraduates, finding a good supply of new undergraduates. Um, Alan Mycroft, who'd been one of my, my PhD examiners. Jack, obviously, has been involved in everything. Um, and Jack knew David, so sort of suggested, suggested to him he might like to get involved. And then Alan bumped into Pete Lomas at uh, an event at Imperial College. Now, Pete runs a company called Norcott up in um, up in Cheshire, and he'd been building. They they do sh specialize in short runs of very high tech PCBs, um, and they'd been building among other things the boards for um, Steve Ferber's um, Human Brain project. You know the big FPG, FPGA boards that they're using for, for for neural net simulations, and he'd been building. They they they're very good at building large boards, and there are there are um, challenges associated with large boards. They warp when you put them in the oven to do to, for reflow and stuff. And they're very good at doing that stuff. And they've been doing some short run work for Imperial. And he happened to be at an event, and he and Alan went for a walk. And at the end of it, Alan had sold him on the idea of becoming our 
our final trustee uh, and obviously you know, then subsequently designer of two generations of Raspberry Pi hardware. Was anybody was anybody approached to be a, a trustee or involved in the organisation that, that decided not to? Um, I, I mean, I think I think it's pretty obvious that John Crowcroft could have been a trustee, but he he's he, I think the great thing about John is really scrupulous and he's he's incredibly busy, um, and he he said no on the basis he didn't think that he'd be able to. My recollection is he said no because he didn't feel that uh, he'd have time to do it properly, and it's a shame because you know John's John's fantastic. But maybe we'll get him one day. I don't think we could have done Raspberry Pi anywhere other than Cambridge. Yeah, because you've got that combination of, you've got the combination of things, right? A lot of it is about, in the end, all of these things are about people, right? You know, nothing, it's not, there, there isn't anything other than people in, in, in technology and innovation. Um, so it's where are the people? Where are the people with the, with the technical knowledge? Where are the people with the business knowledge? Where are the people with the connections to introduce you to the right people to get the stuff done? Uh, where, are the, where is Broadcom based? You know, where was the bit of Broadcom I was working for based? Um, uh, and you know, an enormous amount of the actual practical heavy lifting in Raspberry Pi came out of, came out of Broadcom. You know, came out of individuals at Broadcom uh, doing work in their evenings and weekends. Many of whom now work at actually now work at Raspberry Pi, but people at Broadcom doing work in their evenings and weekends to push this forward. So it's still the case. Yeah, it's still you know the uh, twenty eight thirty six, the chip that's in that's in. Um, uh, that's in Raspberry Pi 2, you know? So a lot of people worked harder on that at Broadcom than they had to, you know, harder than they were paid to do. Um, so, see, it's, you know, where are the people? And there aren't that I mean, We could have done this in Silicon Valley, obviously. I mean, you can do almost anything in Silicon Valley. But outside of, you know, the Bay Area, I'm really not sure there's anywhere else that you could have had the coming together of all the different talents. You know, the, the software and the, and the ASIC level hardware and the board level hardware and the, you know, the business skills and the connections and all of that stuff to make it happen. Go Cambridge. So there's a gap between about 2008 and 2012. And what's in the gap? Two years of my being busy and not much happening, um, except that we managed to get, for the first time, a Cambridge-designed Broadcom chip with an arm in it. So we managed to get a, um, uh, an ARM 11 into a, into a, into a chip um, that was subsequently found other, other markets but was very useful for, uh, very useful for Raspberry Pi. Um, so we, we'd got to a point by about 2010 where there'd been sort of broadcom size stuff going on um, and we had a chip. And then by 2011 we had a, a, a something that felt a bit Raspberry Pi-like. And that, in fact, was a broadcom piece of development hardware. It was a, a device called... Um, uh, it was a little tiny camera board that rejoiced in the name of Sexcam 2, um, but uh, was, was the MicroDB, I think is the, the official name, but everyone called it Sexcam 2. Um, and that was the thing that we first demoed. So the very first thing we showed to, to Rory, the thing that was on our website, uh, the first version of our website, which is this little kind of USB stick type thing, is actually a, a, a Broadcom um, micro, uh, MicroDB. Um, and so we had some hardware, and we kind of made this accidental announcement that we went to see Rory at the BBC, and we were always trying to put the BBC brand on it because you know, we all had our BBC micros, and we, we wanted to we wanted this to be a BBC micro. We got a lovely brand with the Raspberry Pi, and we never we never wanted you know all we wanted was to make a BBC micro. Um, and we went to see him, and he said, look, this is probably not going to happen. It's, there's lots of reasons why you know the BBC can't make computing hardware. Um, you know, it's not uh, something that's compatible with their 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 Obligations of the, you know, the, their governance, um, and, and this was this this was the stock answer. We'd we'd, we'd, we'd asked a bunch of people at the BBC this, um, uh, but what he did say was, could I could I take a video of it and put it on my blog? And he took a picture of David holding it up because uh, uh, the introduction to Rory was through David, um, uh, and he this just video of David holding it up and saying what it was, um, or what we wanted it to be, um, and we got this enormous deluge of attention. Um, and um, then we had to make it. That we'd been pottering along, and you could see that Raspberry Pi might not have happened without that intervention, that kind of accidental intervention from Rory, because that was the kick up the arse that we needed in order to actually do it. Yeah, you know, that we'd kind of nailed our reputations to the mast at that point, and we, we had to do it having said we were going to do it. And that was what drove through 2011, uh, basically, media. first of all, uh, Broadcom. Um, 
built the, um, you've seen the Alpha board, this device is called Alpha boards, which is kind of a big Raspberry Pi, but with the right collection of, uh, the right collection of chips on. Uh, they built us the Alpha boards um, that summer. And then Pete spent a lot of time in the autumn taking that design and turning it into something smaller and more manufacturable. And that's where the, the Raspberry Pi Model B comes from. And I, the, at the same time, I spent a load of time running up and down doing the deals to get us decent price RAM. And, um, uh, you know, my, my deep technical involvement kind of paused at that point. You know, that I'd been involved at the ASIC level, I was involved at the chip level, but by and large what I was doing in 2011 while Pete was doing the board level design was running around trying to make the thing, trying to do the RAM deal, the network chip deal. Obviously the Broadcom deal was easy because, you know, we, we had you know, access to the right people. Um, RAM was difficult. I mean, try buying 10,000 DRAMs at a decent price. It's pretty tough. And we got some lovely support from Hynix on that. Um, we got, um, we used a chip called LAN 951, well, used at the time a chip called LAN 9512 from a company called SNSC, which is our USB hub and Ethernet chip. Um, and the DISTI price of that was about four bucks fifty, um, and which would just blew the budget completely. Uh, and I, um, I was talking to Mouser um, about maybe stocking the Raspberry Pi, and I said to them, look, you, you stock this chip, get me a good price on it. Right, and I'll do you a deal. I'll, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you stock the Raspberry Pi. And they, yeah, bless them, did go to Microchip and to, to SMSC and ask them, uh, you know, for pricing. And they said no. And he came back, and the guy replies to me and says, "Look, no deal. We can't do anything for you." But he left the email chain. He left the 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 whole chain of discussion with SMSC on on the on, appended to the end of the email. And he. Um, uh, Somewhere down there, there was someone that said, um, if, you, if, if the customer's got any wishes to kind of protest about this and has any queries, tell them to speak to uh, Michelle Bongiorno, I think, in, in, on the East Coast, and it was in, in New York. Um, and I, so I phoned her up, and there was a phone number. I phoned her up. <laughs> and I said, look, we're trying to buy these chips off you, and we can't pay the DISTI price, you know. What gives? I'll buy ten thousand of these chips off you, um, and um, she to get me to go away um, gave me the contact details of a guy called Ray Sinclair, who's uh, a salesman who was a salesman for them in out of Germany, uh, and I phoned him up. I said, "I'm going to buy ten thousand chips. Give me a, give me a good price," um, and he did, um, and he gave me a price of I think it was perhaps of the order of two bucks fifty. For ten thousand, so I saved you know two bucks on each unit, which was the difference between it working and it not working. Um, and he, um, I mean, subsequently they we bought millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of chips off them on the back of Ray taking a taking. And it turns out Ray's incredibly well. Ray's another guy like Ian Nussi who's incredibly well known that you're in the particular se sector. You you mentioned you mentioned is that oh it's Ray yeah no I know Ray, um, but yeah no he and I got to meet him about three years later. I'd only known him over the phone. I got to meet him when he handed off to to, to his successor. We had, we had a meeting and I got to say thanks for the. You got to say thanks to the business, and I got to say, well, thanks for taking a chance on us when we were nothing. You know, and a lot of people, there was a lot of that with Raspberry Pi. A lot of people taking a chance on us when we were nothing, who's then subsequently, you know, did good business, have done good business with us. So, so yeah, that was that was great. And you know, Hynix similarly very very helpful. Um, yeah, and then the last piece to come. So the last piece to come together was uh, was was manufacturing. We'd hoped that Pete. We'd hoped to be able to manufacture with Pete, but there was just no room on his on his line, and so we had to this frantic scramble to find a contract manufacturer. Went around a lot of UK contract manufacturers, got absolutely no love at all. <laughs> you know, all these places just gave us these prices. Either their cost structure was very bad, or they were deliberately giving us ridiculous quotes to make us go away, or on the, on the off chance that we said yes and they could make a bit of money. Um, and so we ended up going to China. Um, and we got um, a guy called a guy called Naren at uh, uh, Naren Sankar at Broadcom, who's based in Taipei, found us a contract manufacturer in Shenzhen, a company called Ego Man, um, and they they built our first again. They I think we had an MOQ of two thousand units or something. Our first batch, our first pallet, two thousand units, and they did between one and two million units with us in the end. But again, they gave us a good price. Yeah, they gave us they gave us a good price and. Um, and, and took a chance on us when, when nobody else would. So, so that was kind of, 2011 was about this kind of surprise announcement and then this frantic work, me and Pete, doing this kind of frantic double act, trying to get, get the business together and then a product to actually make. Um, 
Uh, and Liz had um, Liz was a Liz was a journalist at the time. She was a freelance journalist at the time, and she um, uh, quit. She kind of dropped all of her freelance work on on the floor pretty much as soon as we'd done this announcement and started volunteering for us. And she was our first full time volunteer, first full time kind of unpaid employee. Uh, from two weeks in. And so you, the thing with Raspberry Pi, you see this kind of peculiarity with Raspberry Pi where we're, we're a computer company, we're a hardware company. Um, but a lot of what we do is about community and social um, and, and, and trying to support the community and doing cool stuff with our product. And kind of the reason for that is we kind of, we kind of grew, grew in reverse. You know, most people, they, they build a product and then they try and build a community, social marketing sort of thing around it. Whereas what we had for the first six, nine months of Raspberry Pi, all we had, I mean, you remember what this was like at the, the, BBC, at the BBC 30th anniversary thing. Um, it was this enormous community of people who were really excited about the product. Um, and, and, and we had that before we had the product. And so it's kind of this, this you know, having Liz as our first, um, having Liz as our first full-time person really kind of set the tone. Um, and it was great, except what it meant was we, uh, the demand was getting ahead of our ability to finance it. Uh, um, it you know, it was, it was getting to the point where we knew we had demand probably for tens of thousands of units. Uh, and we were able to scrape together. We scraped together enough. It's a $25 computer, so if you can build 10,000 of them, you need about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, the we scraped that together. I put about thirty grand in. David put about thirty grand in. Jack put about thirty grand in. Uh, we had a little bit of money from elsewhere. Uh, we had some donations uh, as well. And so we just kind of had enough to make ten thousand. But we were starting to get a bit nervous that ten thousand wasn't going to be enough. That it might we we might sell those ten thousand over the course of you know a few weeks, and then there'd be a big delay while we got some more made. Um, and so in, in January and February of 2012, right, right at the end, we kind of pivoted around from being a, uh, a hardware-focused company to being a, um, to being, uh, a licensing-focused company. So we found two licensee partners, um, uh, Element 14 and RS, um, who both signed up to not just distribute Raspberry Pi, but actually make it or have it made. So that gets us out of the loop. So these are big, these are big, Companies, they've got fantastic worldwide logistics. This is why we were, you could buy Raspberry Pi in South Africa on the first day, you know, once you got to the end of the queue, once you got to the head of the queue. Uh, you, could buy, you could buy them anywhere on the first day. Um, so we got that kind of worldwide logistics reach. We also got the working capital. You know, we didn't have to go and raise, we're a charity. We can't, we can't raise, we can't sell shares. So we got a, a product that we know we can make that we can make without losing money, but no way to go and raise capital. So by turning ourselves from a hardware company into a licensing company, and that's kind of taking a, a bit of a page out of arms book. So it's another reason why you know, being in Cambridge is useful. You know, you've got a kind of inspirational model there of a company that decided, unlike everybody else who was doing what they were doing, they decided they weren't going to make stuff. Right, they decided they were going to design stuff and then other people can handle the making. And it's turned out to be a great business model for them and it's been a great business model for us. Um, and so we found these licensee partners. We signed the contracts with them. Uh, we launched at um, Electronic World in uh, Nuremberg in, on the 29th of um, February 2012. And we signed the contracts the day before. I think one of the contracts we might have signed actually technically on the day, right at 1 a.m. or something. Um, so... So we launched Electronic World, um, and I tell you, the licensing thing was a great decision because we sold 100,000 in the first day, and that seemed to be largely determined by the ability of the two partners' websites to not crash. Um, uh, and um, yeah, our enormous enthusiasm, just that, that's that level of enthusiasm. I think we, what happened with Raspberry Pi was we, we, we tapped into a demand for a thing. There was already demand there. There was latent demand for a thing like Raspberry Pi. And the pitch with Raspberry Pi has been we've drifted away from um, programmable hardware. We've drifted away from general purpose hardware towards a more kind of appliance-like world of games, consoles, and, and mobile phones, and tablets, and stuff, um, which kind of alienates you from all this awesome computing power you have. So we've, we've, developed, we've developed computing power, which is thousands of times what we had with the BBC Micro, but they are in some ways less useful because they're kind of in a, in a sealed unit. Um, and it turned out that was, a, that was we were right that people felt alienated. And so you had this group, you had people, particularly in that first year, primarily hobbyists, primarily people who already had some knowledge of, of computing uh, and had something that they wanted to, they wanted to build. Um, 
some project they wanted to do uh, and no real platform to do it with. Um, and so Pi kind of just slotted into this. There was just a gap in the market. Uh, and Pi just slotted into the gap. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's not fair to Liz to say we didn't have to market it. But it was kind of a, it was kind of a dream product to market, right? Because it met a need which was complete, which was enormous and completely unfilled by anyone else. And so, the mar marketing wasn't about marketing Raspberry Pi wasn't about um, convincing people they needed it, which is what marketing is often about. It's about telling people it exists, right? Um, and, and and so it was. Um, uh, very, very steep vertical curve. You know, it took people four, five, six months to get their Raspberry Pi that they got in the queue for at 7 a.m. that morning. Um, and people, it, it's, it's, it's still remarkable to me that people stuck with us and people put up with that, you know, that people really did. I think the vast, vast majority of people were understanding about the fact that it's just very hard to go from zero to, you know, from a standing start to, to, to shipping 100,000 of something is difficult. And there's a massive difference between making 2,000 of something, which is what we made at launch, and uh, even 100,000, let alone the sort of seven or eight million that we've, that we've built now. So, so yeah, 2011 was frantically trying to make the thing exist. 2012 was frantically trying to make the thing exist in volume. Um, although the nice thing, I mean, the really nice thing about 2012 was even in that first year, we were able to get some of the manufacturing back into the UK. Um, so although I'd been to see all of those contract manufacturers and I hadn't found anyone who could build it, what I hadn't realised was that Sony do contract manufacture. You know, it's the best kept secret in South Wales, right? Um, and on launch day, I got an email from a guy, uh, Ted Roberts, who, kind of, who does kind of freelance marketing stuff for them, saying, I, I, I represent a UK, a UK company, a UK contract manufacturer. They think they can build your Raspberry Pi product for a competitive price. And we had this kind of like kind of dance over the next couple of weeks where I'd tell him a little more information about us and he'd tell me a little bit more information. At the end, I sent them pretty much the entire plan to the Raspberry Pi and he told me it was Sony. And I had a meeting, I had a meeting with Sony on the Monday before Good Friday. Um, I had a meeting with Sony on the Monday, drove over there, it was nearly late, had a meeting with them. Um, on the Wednesday, Mike Buffon uh, from Farnell, who was there, the F Sort of the, the guy who really made Raspberry Pi work at Farnell. He was uh, Harriet Green's fixer, um, you know, the person she'd always put on uh, on any hard problem. Um, he'd done um, that march. The previous march, he'd, he'd been the tsunami in in in, um, uh, in Japan, and he managed their kind of recovery from that. And then this march, he was managing the Raspberry Pi thing, and he told me, you know, next march, I'm going to take the whole of march off, um, and. Um, uh, yeah, the Wednesday before Good Friday, Mike was down there. And then over the next two, three, four months, he and Pete and I worked with the Sony people to get the cost really where it needed to be. And they started coming off the line in, uh, in Wales in, in the August. It's kind of cool. So what was the lowest point of this whole thing? What was the lowest how point? high was the high? What was the what was the lowest what was the lowest point for, for me? Is your point you thought that it might not happen or um, the right price? Yeah, I mean the, when we found Absolutely. what? Absolutely. No, that was I, I mean lo, low points. Um, we we had a um, when when we realised Pete couldn't build that there wasn't room for Pete to build them for us when we well, when our manufacturing our kind of draft manufacturing plan went astray and I couldn't find a UK manufacturer um, we had some I mean we had some issues with we had some issues with bringing up the Far Eastern manufacturer we had a couple of component issues you know sort of different wrong components being used not maliciously but just communication difficulties um, the the whole compliance thing we didn't we went through a bit of a compliance headache um, uh, where we hadn't really realized that we were going to need to get the thing CE and FCC tested. And then we had to basically test it after we'd built a bunch of product. And that was tough because you can't test a product into compliance. You know, it either complies or it doesn't, and we were lucky. So that was, that was, that was a low. Um, yeah. Um, I think after that, I mean, no, the, the, the highs, the, the launch day was amazing. Um, uh, Pi 2 launch day it was amazing. 
Um, so so first of first of February last year, um, first of February, second of February last year. Um, that was amazing at the Shard, um, doing doing the launch for that. That was that was quite something. Um, just the, the, and then I guess probably kind of a, not a single event, but a kind of a diffuse good thing, that, that feeling about a year in as we started to, as we, as we started to turn the corner from, from only hobbyists to hobbyists in education, that, the, you know, we, we, the, it was great having the hobbyists using it the first year, but there was always in the na back of your mind this nagging concern that all you were doing was selling to hobbyists. And so you were, you, you were kind of accomplishing kind of my original, hey, let's build cool stuff thing, but you weren't actually accomplishing the mission, you weren't accomplishing the goal. Um, and, and then that just feeling as you started to see the hobbyists show their kids how to use it, as you started to see hobbyists take them into schools or hobbyists who were teachers start to use them in the classroom. Um, that was and so as the and that showed up the you could see the, the the tone of the blog. So Liz, one of the big things Liz did and still does on a day to day basis is is to run the Raspberry Pi blog. Uh, and you could see the tone of the things change from a first year where we were talking about it was us telling the world about the product and about our challenges. We were always very open about the challenges we were having getting it made. Uh, and then the second year where it was kind of geeks doing geek stuff with it. And then the third year onwards where there's been a kind of blend across into still a very strong hobbyist thing, but with an equal, equal parts um, uh, education. And then, of course, industrial. You know, people actually using the thing to build products, which is great because you know, we, we, we like that people are building businesses on the back of Raspberry Pi. So, so that, and that, that sort of feeling of things having gone in the right direction was a really, was a really positive thing in sort of 2013, I guess. Not to put too fine a point on it, but you must have been like a rock star when, <laughs> when it was at the bottom. I mean, it, it was, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 very, it's very strange. And of course, I now spend a lot, I do still do some small amount of technical work on, on the product because I, I've hired the brightest guys I know, right? I mean, pretty much everybody in that office is scary. I mean, they're just, they're terrifying, right? All of them. Um, you know, I've, I've gone through my address book and I've just hired the people who I find intimidatingly smart and there are a few holdouts, but by and large, I've got most of the, the, the ultra, yeah, the thing with, I'm a big believer in the 10X engineer. I know the cult of the 10X engineer is kind of, um, uh, is kind of, um, people worry about the cult. I've seen people write articles about the 10X engineers saying that it basically it's a, it's a cult and it's not real and it promotes a lot of uh, very negative ways of working, but um, they exist and I employ a bunch of them, right? Um, and so I do still do a bit of engineering. I do engineering because I'm terrified that, you know, I can't be the guy who isn't as good as those guys. Um, and, and, and so I still do a little bit, but by and large, I, by and large, I, I, run, I run the business. Um, and it's very strange for me because I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm a geek. You know, I, I've stood up on stage and talked. I would did my biggest one ever was PyCon. There's four or 5,000 people in this auditorium in Santa Clara and on a stage which was 18 inches high. And from that high off the ground, that many people fills, goes to the horizon pretty much. You know, you, it's just a sheet of people until the people are too small to see. And, and I've... Um, and um, Jesse, who was organising it that year, bought a Raspberry Pi for everybody, and it was in their swag. It was in their swag bag, and he they had a little token in the swag bag saying, uh, "Trade this in for your free gift." And he said, pretty much, he introduced me and said, um, "Oh yeah, the free, the free, uh, the free thing in your in your in your swag is a Raspberry Pi." Crowd goes wild, and I go up on stage, and it's this kind of, but it's terrifying. You know, it's 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 oh, it's not where I come from at all, standing up and, and talking to lots of people about stuff. And, um, and I must have done, I've done a lot of them. I've got it wrong sometimes. I've had a couple where I've just failed utterly. But it's, 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 it's weird to be a, a, a geek, an engineer, and, and to have the majority of my life be now be doing CEO-ly things you know, standing up and you know, making the keeping the business keeping the business going and the, and the relationships going, and then standing up on stage and and, and in front of cameras and, and you know talking about this this awesome thing we've got. Um, so it's an experience. Recommend it to anyone. It's great. <laughs> how bad? How bad can it possibly be? Right? 
Um, so you, just can you clarify, the, the, the uh, 18 inch, so was no. it a stage or were you levitating? I was levitating. I was levitating with the power of my self-belief. I was, and I knew that if I, if I dropped to the floor, everything would fall apart. No, it was, uh, that was good. It's, 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 been, it's been weird, and it's, it's, a, it's, a hell of a way, it's a hell of a way to earn a living. Right, there was always a risk that computing was a thing which was a generational interest, right? That my grandfather could drive a car, and my father can take a car apart into its component parts and put it back together, and I can drive a car. And there's this one, one generation spike where this stuff is interesting. And that was always kind of the, if Raspberry Pi is a hypothesis test, right, the null hypothesis is kids don't care anymore, right? The null hypothesis is kids want to play Candy Crush, right? Um, and it turned out, it's, it's turned out that I think we're very close now to proving that um, kids do care. The kids were, just like the rest of us, kids have become alienated from technology and that they find it interesting. Kids, kids always enjoy knowing something their parents don't know. You know, the, the appeal of having a skill, having se oh, the appeal of secret knowledge is incredibly powerful. And, and what we've discovered in the work we've done and the work guys like Code Club have done, um, uh, who of course we've merged with now, um, the... Um, uh, it is to show that yeah, actually kids are, kids do care, and this isn't a generational thing. This could be an eternal. This could be an eternal thing. This could be a thing which goes on for a very very long time. This kind of renaissance, and that's really good news, right? Because we need we need engineers, and we can. We look back on the we look back on the nineteen eighties as this kind of um, uh, this kind of golden age, but it wasn't a golden age at all, right? I mean, you look at the people who came out of it; they all look like us, right? You know, they're all you know white guys. <laughs> you know, it's it was it's it's a it's a it, you know it was the um, socioeconomic diversity was crap. The um, uh, race diversity was crap, and the gender diversity was crap. Right? You know, all it did, if you look at the computer industry, it's a very skewed. It's not a picture of modern society, uh, and and the opportunity that we have in front of us now, and particularly the opportunity with and the, the route, a lot of the route to this opportunity is through doing um, uh, um, stuff in schools, is through doing um, formal education. We've always kind of like been focused on, hot. my natural inclination is to focus on hobbyists, because that's what I was, right? Uh, but if you focus too much on hobbyists, what you get is you get this unrepresentative, um, you get this kind of unrepresentative participation, you get the participation among the people who already have advantages in their lives. Um, by going and really doing good work at the school level, you can get a uniformity of access, and you can start to use, um, uh, the one I'm most excited about is, is um, a socioeconomic thing. I think that, you know, um, STEM subjects, hard sciences, maths, computing, can be a ladder for people, can be a ladder. Social mobility in this country is going to hell at the moment. Um, hard sciences are a ladder because you can't fake being good at maths, right? Maths doesn't care who your dad is. You know, maths doesn't care, who, maths doesn't care if your parents can afford to get you an internship somewhere. Maths doesn't care if you're, you know, they can you know, call up their old mate and get you a job in their advertising agency, right? Uh, maths doesn't care. You're either good at maths or you're bad at maths. The, the, the program either runs or it crashes. You know, the bridge either stands up or it falls down. You can't fake it. Um, and that's what I'm, you know, I had enormous advantages as a kid. I mean, the background that I came from, I had enormous advantages. Um, and the opportunity we've got now is to do better than the 1980s because we can make sure that people who don't have those sorts of advantages uh, but have the talent, have the skills, have the underlying kind of resourcefulness can get an opportunity to find out. Yeah, that's it. What's the most exciting or impressive or whatever thing that you've seen done with the Raju Pi? What, what's Really, really hit you and go, wow, I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, Astro Pi, right? We've got two, two Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station. <laughs> and Tim unpacked them early. You know, he got them out, he got them out earlier than was, in the, than was in the mission schedule. You know, we've got two Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station. And we've got code written by kids running on the ISS, being run by a British, a British astronaut on the ISS. I'm a big space geek. I am the ultimate space geek. And this, this was funny. I mean, Astro Pi came out of um, uh, a conversation. So Alison Greenwood, who runs um, uh, 
the, the PR for the business school. So I did my MBA here in Cambridge, 2009 to 2011. So just before Raspberry Pi kicked off, I did the, the MBA here. Um, her brother, Rick, um, works for, I think, for EADS. Uh, and she, we'd been talking and she just said, oh, my brothers, you should go down, go down to uh, Hatfield, you know, to the big Airbus facility at Hatfield, go have a chat with them. And they went down there, uh, went down there with Dave Honus, who works for the foundation and um, was also a massive space geek. Um, and they have a meeting room which has a big window that looks out over the uh, the clean room bays where they build the um, they build the satellites. Uh, and the, if you enter the meeting room, these these windows open, and the guy goes, turns to us and goes, "Yeah, sorry, lads, Stargate's out for cleaning today." <laughs> But it was like kind of Stargate Command kind of thing. Um, and it all grew out of that little, little contact. And that was, I went back when we, when we, when we did the launch um, in December, I went back and looked at my email and that was 18 months. It was 18 months from concept to all the way through running the content, designing the hardware, uh, designing the casing, running the contest with the kids, judging the contest, getting the thing flight qualified, and getting the thing fi flight qualified, Jonathan and, uh, and Dave gave a year of their lives to, to get the thing qualified. You know, they say when the, uh, when the paperwork weighs more than the payload, it's time to fly. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's, that's it, that's it. I mean, for me, that's it, right? I mean, hey, you know, low Earth orbit. You know, next stop, Mars, what? Um, so it's a nice little, uh, Nice little platform. It has about the same amount of processing power that the current generation of um, sort of Mars rovers um, have, um, but not obviously in a rad hard. It's not in a rad hard. Those have to carry the burden of being rad hard where we, we get to be built on for. I did actually have somebody get in touch with me once and ask me if Broadcom would make a, um, a custom silicon on sapphire, a rad hard version of 2835. Um, and I said, well, William, what's the volume? He said, oh, probably 40, 40 pieces maybe. Like, I can take it to I can take it to management, but I suspect it's probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, so that was that's that's the winner for me. Anything to do with space, the astronomy ones, Dave Aikman's ballooning, yeah, all of those things, love them. Yeah, I think Raspberry Pi's been it's been more than we could have it been more than we could have dreamed, right? I mean, it's had a it's had the impact we wanted it to have. We have more applicants for computer science here at Cambridge now than we had at the height of the dot com boom. Um, there's a general not just because of us, but there's a lot of other people doing stuff in this area, um, you know, um, and uh, all of those. There's a kind of advance on a very on a very broad front at the moment um, in, in computing education. So, um, uh, yeah, and so the fact that it's had the success we wanted in Cambridge, the fact it's had the success, the wider success, the fact it's had international success, over 80% of Raspberry Pis go overseas now. The US is way our largest market. Um, and uh, so, yeah, British computer company that cracked the United States. That's not happened before. Um, so that's fun. Um, so, yeah, you know, and it, it's, it's just, you know, the fact we've been able to, to, to attract such a high caliber of, 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 pe of, of people to come work for us. Yeah, that's been a uh, uh, that's that's been fantastic, um, and that we keep having fun, and that we keep pushing the platform forward. That's the other nice thing, you know, that we keep doing engineering. We're still making cool new things. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So so yeah, when I say we still do cool new stuff, Pi Zero is the obvious recent cool new stuff. Yeah, we we found we can make a five dollar computer. So why not? Um, you know, it's it's one of these things where it would be very easy to. Pi is successful, right? And it's kind of become a standard and, and people, it's the right choice for the vast majority of people who want to do something in this area just because it's, it's really well engineered and it's got this enormous community around it. So if you have a problem with your Raspberry Pi, you just Google it and somebody else will have had the same problem and solved it. Right? So it's, it's got this kind of um, inertia now behind it. Uh, and it would be very easy for us to sit there and kind of milk that and go, well, you know, we're just going to sit there selling our 20 to $35 machines and, you know, we're going to try too hard on, on cost reduction and stuff. But we've got to remember that um, there's always that. Um, there are always people for whom any given price is too much, right? There's always, always people. And if you pick a price point, there will be some people who can't afford that price point. And that's true of the 20, 20 to $35 price of the main Raspberry Pi. So when we discovered we could build a $5 Raspberry Pi, we kind of we kind of had to, um, and and so that's been a big it was a big part of our work this year after the Pi two stuff kind of kind of leveled off after after we got the engineering done on Pi two um, trying to do something cheaper that's Pi zero it turns out people like that as well we're back in the same position with Pi zero that we were with with the original Pi right which is 
got this little product with, you know, at a new price point, with enormous demand, trying to ramp production fast enough, where we placed a fairly conservative original production order, you know, sort of hundreds of thousands, uh, and then trying to trying to ramp production fast enough so that people don't spend a lot of time waiting in the queue. At least we've not taken people's orders. This, uh, this, this, this no one's order's been taken this time. So people are just in a notify me queue, not in an I placed an order with you queue. Um, so that's, you know, the... Uh, doesn't mean people aren't still very hungry for those little devices. I was in a factory last week and I took a picture of, uh, you know, a, a rack of, you know, four or 5,000 of them um, ready, to, ready to ship, which cheered people up. Giving away on the front of the magazine. Yeah, giving away the first computer magazine ever to give. Yeah, that's a fun thing we did. Um, the Magpie. Um, so we 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 kind of kind of it's a bizarre piece of piece of kind of horizontal integration. You know, the 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 yeah you know, that we we publish our own magazine about the Raspberry Pi, and of course having that allowed us to do this kind of fun giveaway where we said, well, you know, people used to give away cover discs and cover CDs and stuff. Can we give away? It was a computer magazine. We should give away a computer, right? Um, and yeah, I think civil insurrection in, in branches of Smiths on the, uh, on, at the end of the end of November. That was kind of fun. Um, it was kind of odd because of street dates, um, because the street dates are always Thursdays, always the last Thursday of every month. Uh, we ended up launching on Thanksgiving, which is unusual. People don't tend to launch electronic products on, on, on Thanksgiving, so our American friends were a little bit confused. But um, uh, yeah, that was a popular. That was a popular issue of that magazine. You can see the sales. <laughs> you can see the sales spike in uh, for, for the uh, for issue forty. Um, yeah. I'd pay about forty-five quid for it on eBay. <laughs> you could just have got a subscription. <laughs> it's our subscription. Say, uh, our cheapest uh, subscription is uh, thirteen pounds. Well, you could have got a year's subscription for that. Um, well, uh, or just uh, phone me up. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I was um, I was on the, the BBC Make yeah. Digital tour. Mm. Um, yeah. I thought for fun it'd be nice to yeah. just to have it because uh, that wasn't out. Yes. Um, <laughs> that wasn't, uh, and uh, so yeah. I was just showing people yeah. uh, at uh, the end of the BBC yeah. uh, Manchester. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was fun. Well, you know, so it's nice to convince other people to. Yeah, so to, I thought to, it was uh, worth paying that money just to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, look at that. <laughs> it's good. It makes a great key ring. Earrings, Christmas tree de decoration, you know. Uh, we should start selling it with a key ring, actually, because it's kind of nice to be able to, oh, it's my Unix box on my key ring, you know. So. You can go buy well, key rings for a fiver or more. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's, it's, good, it's good value. I did like the earrings, though. We had somebody did, did earrings with. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. No, we thank you. It. Thank um, you. No, one, one, one question. Um, so how much of this was developed on Broadcom's time without them knowing about it? How much of it was developed on Broadcom's time? Well, see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that on the video. Um, you don't know. <laughs> How much of it was developed on Broadcom's time without Broadcom knowing about it? Um, I don't think any of it was developed on Broadcom's time because I think some of it was... I don't think any of it... I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is productive. The answer, the answer is... Yes. Yeah. Right, anyway, let's move it on swiftly. Yeah.